Hi, this is Keith Strop. I'm the founder of Normal, and this is my dope history. Keith Strop is an indispensable figure in the fight for legal cannabis. Some activists grew massive fields of cannabis in protest, and others spoke with open disdain for the system. Keith used his most effective weapons, his intellect and beliefs, to effectively change the minds of the voting public and our elected officials. He was a latecomer to cannabis, but in that moment, Keith discovered a profound love of the plant and instinctually recognized that the stories told to the masses about cannabis and the associated dangers just weren't true. Keith Strop is the founder of Normal, which to any cannabis advocate is a household name and is often regarded as the most influential organization in the fight for cannabis legalization. Keith Strop and Normal have been at the forefront of pushing legislative change for over 50 years. It is with great honor that we get to share his dope history. I had first smoked marijuana when I was a freshman at Georgetown Law School. I started later than a lot of people. As an undergraduate, I attended my state university, the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, and I was a typical, you know, college uh, kid who, a fraternity brat who drank too much alcohol, etc. And I remember a, a few people, a handful, not many, in my fraternity who we, we sort of knew they were smoking marijuana, but at the time, I guess I was getting all uh, the inebriation I wanted from the alcohol. I just wasn't curious enough to even check it out. I it just it wasn't, I was too mainstream at the time to be that experimental. But by the time I got to college or to law school, a couple of friends of mine who uh, had been fraternity brothers back at the University of Illinois were also in Washington, D.C. And one weekend we decided to take a little trip up into southern Pennsylvania to ski for the weekend. There were three of us. And one of the three brought along a couple of joints. And in that, uh, uh, safe setting after we got off the ski slope the first day we went back to our room and, and uh, we lit that joint up and we did our best to try to get high and frankly I, we weren't even sure that we were doing it right none of us had any real experience I think the guy that brought the marijuana had obviously tried it a couple of times and so we laughed and giggled and, and got hungry and you know ate junk food but we weren't quite sure if we were high or not then the second day, we couldn't wait to get off the ski slopes uh, so we could have that second joint. So uh, by that point, it was feeling pretty good. And uh, I frankly never looked back. By the time I got, uh, when we came back to Washington, D.C., where I was living, um, I couldn't uh, couldn't wait to track down a source where I could get my own my own marijuana. And uh, I've been a regular smoker ever since. I'm, I'm now 74 years old, so I've been smoking for quite a while. <laughs> I've been busted twice, and uh, in some ways, I'd have to consider those as being a, a down experience, downer experience. But the reality was, because of my work with Normal and the availability of uh, terrific lawyers who would step up and help me out, uh, I actually uh, kind of enjoyed both of those. I I was in the mid to late seventies. I was going to Canada to give a, a lecture at the uh, Cal- University of Calgary. I think it was. And at the time, uh, I never actually left the country. I'm a foreign boy from Illinois. So uh, I thought going to Canada was sort of like, you know, going to Iowa from Illinois. And whenever I would go give lectures, I would always have at least one joint I'd roll and put in my coat pocket. Because, you know, after the lecture, the kids always want to go back and and smoke. And uh, I'd do it, but they usually had pretty weak, (laughs) you know, dirt weed and stuff. (laughs) It wasn't great. And I always had fun pulling out a really good dynamite joint and get them really stoned so anyway i get to the i get to the border and i'm just about to go through it but in addition to having a joint in my pocket i had a gold marijuana leaf pin on my lapel i mean how stupid can you be naive (laughs) well so the guy finally stops me and finds the joint i had to call the students to have them bring the lecture fee to bail me out so i could give the lecture (laughs) and and then when uh, when they set the, the case for trial, uh, Jerry Goldstein, a dear friend of mine, a wonderful criminal defense lawyer from Texas, um, he went with me to represent me. And uh, uh, Trudeau, uh, the uh, father of the current uh, uh, premier in Canada, uh, uh, Trudeau had said at the time with all the anti-war stuff going on that if – 
if American youngsters want to come up to Canada to get away from this and they want to bring a joint or two, that's no problem. And literally, there had been an article in the Washington Post in which he had been quoted as saying this. Pierre Trudeau, this was. And uh, I, of course, that wasn't why I had the joint, but it looked like it was some great street theater. So we took that article and I took the stand and said, of course, I had a joint. I was relying on the representation of your your prime minister. It was called the Pierre Trudeau defense. <laughs> and of course, the judge laughed. He he ended up convicting me and finding me a little bit and tell me get the hell out of the country. <laughs> and the other the other time I got busted was almost similarly. I was at the Boston Freedom Rally and I think this was in 2007 or 2008. And we used to always share a booth with High Times Magazine. Rick Cusick is on our board and Rick was a long time High Times guy. And uh, so we're working a combined booth there. And at some point, uh, I said, to Rick, let's let's get go behind the booth and smoke a joint. And he said, sure. So we go back there, and I light up a joint. We're about halfway through it when down c- come these two uh, undercover narcs. One of them grabs me by the shoulder, and uh, the other one grabs Rick. And remember, now I'm 70. At that time, maybe I was 68 or something. Uh, but I've had white hair for a long time, and so I, I looked every bit of my age. And Rick also has white hair. And so anyway, the guy grabs me by the shoulders and he says, uh, do you're old enough to know better. <laughs> it was, it wasn't that I was smoking marijuana. It was that I was too old to be smoking marijuana. So they took us into the tent where they would book, uh, they, you know, they had arrested some other kids for underage smoking and stuff. And then they noticed that we were speakers. We had these big badges, you know, around their neck that said speaker. And they said, Oh God. So they finally say to us, look, if you're willing, uh, they'll give us a citation to appear in court at a later date. If you're willing to leave the park and act like you're leaving, you can go around to the other side of the Boston Common. We won't bother you and come back in so you can give your speech, which I thought was a pretty good, pretty good resolution on the short run. Yeah. Um, and then uh, so we did and had no more problem that day. And then when we went to uh, trial a month or two months later, we had the benefit, again, of Lester Grinspoon from Harvard as our expert witnesses, and we had one of the Harvard law professor uh, who volunteered his time to, to represent us. And uh, we, we get to the assignment judge when the day of the trial, and the judge says to the prosecutor, how much marijuana is involved here? And he holds up this little baggie that has like half a joint. And the judge looks at it and says, oh, well, he said, if the defendants will just pay court costs, let's just dismiss this. Our lawyer hops up and says, no, Your Honor, our, our clients de- demand a jury trial. And he said, well, then then he says, then I'll waive the, the court costs. You know, let's just dismiss it. And he says, no, Your Honor, they want to go to trial. And then he looks at us and realizes what we're doing. We were trying to get a, you know, a jury to no pros. And, and uh, we thought if one person could stand up and openly say, yes, I smoke marijuana, but the jury refused to convict, uh, then every other person who got busted would know, do the same thing. You know, you're, they probably can't get a conviction. That that happened, by the way, at the end of alcohol prohibition as well, where they had trouble with juries. So at any event, when they start, we, we, he assigns us to a judge, and we get to the jury selection part, and the judge is saying to the first jury pool, he said, now, uh, anybody here have a reason or opinion that's so strong you couldn't uh, be fair in this trial? And one guy raises his hand, he says, Your Honor, I don't care if they light a joint up on the uh, on the stand. I am not going to vote to convict him. <laughs> well, obviously, he's the guy we needed, but he should have should have kept his mouth shut. That was what we were looking for. At any event, of course, he, the judge had to excuse him, and the other jurors didn't have much trouble. Within an hour or two, they convicted us. But the judge knew exactly what we were doing. He appreciated it. The prosecutor hops up to demand uh, that we be drug tested as part of our probation. He wasn't trying to get us in jail, but he knew if he – if he had us on a required drug test, that neither one of us would ever pass that. And so the judge interrupted him and said, no fine, no probation, case dismissed. <laughs> I was I was lucky enough that the two times that I was arrested over these many years, uh, it was it was a, a exhilarating experience. I recognize for most uh, defendants in a, in a marijuana case, it's not exhilarating. Because I, I don't live in a place where we have dispensaries yet, uh, we have dispensaries in D.C. for medical, but not for recreational. And I live across the river in the Virginia suburbs, so we don't have either. But um, 
so I'm not, I don't have the luxury of choosing like when I'm out in Colorado or Washington or someplace. But I would say that the probably the strain that I have most smoked over the last 10, 12 years is train wreck. And I've always enjoyed train wreck. But again, I'll be honest, um, I, I like all the marijuana I get. Uh, most of it's grown in Northern California, some of it in, in Oregon and Washington. And uh, I've never yet had a sample that I uh, wasn't pleased with. Uh, the quality of the marijuana grown domestically uh, is the best in the world. You know, when we were starting off, uh, nobody wanted domestic grown marijuana. We, you know, we thought Acapulco gold and tie sticks. And there were, you know, all kinds of, of, of imports that we look for. But the last thing we wanted was homegrown. Well, that has truly uh, changed over the last several decades to where it's not just good marijuana, it's the best marijuana in the world that's grown in the U.S. It's better even than they have in Amsterdam. Now, I, I, I suspect that along these many years of smoking marijuana, it's probably been helpful to me in, in numerous ways. Uh, for example, I, when I was 65 years old, I began to have seizures for a few years. Uh, they, I no longer have them. I, I apparently worked my way through that phase. And I, for a number of years, I took some anti-seizure medication. But when I call Lester Grinspoon from Harvard, who's been kind of the intellectual godfather of this whole legalization movement, and he has been, he was chairman of the board of normal for many years, et cetera. And I called him when I had my first seizure and I said, Lester, I, I don't know what to think. I didn't even know what epilepsy was. And now apparently I'm an epileptic. And he laughed and said, well, Keith, I'll tell you, first off, uh, you probably would have had seizures far earlier in your life, except you've been taking the best anti-seizure medication on a daily basis for years. <laughs> wow. And I think he, I think he's right, by the way. Uh, it's uh, seizures and epilepsy is one of the causes or one of the conditions for which most of, most all of the states that have adopted medical marijuana have recognized that it's helpful to people who have seizures. So um, uh, where was I going there? Um, the point I was going to make is that I, I don't mean to suggest that I don't think the medical use of marijuana is legitimate or important. I do. Indeed, I think it's incredibly important. It's, it's sort of a wonder drug for people with all kinds of conditions and serious life-threatening conditions. Uh, but that, that wasn't my motivation. My motivation was I was still looking for a good time and a, and a nice high, and I found that with marijuana... Um, I could get sort of as high as I wanted, and I didn't feel hungover in the morning. I might be a little dull for a few minutes when I first woke up, but it wasn't like it used to be with alcohol, where if you drank too much, you were hungover, and you couldn't you couldn't really do any productive work for a day or so. Uh, so my interest in marijuana started off being purely hedonistic. The late 60s were an interesting time in American history. We were at war overseas, and our conscience was divided at home. At this time, the draft for military service was in place and many eligible males were being selected for service. Keith Strop was one of those young gentlemen selected to receive combat training and experience, but the idea was unappealing to him. With hindsight, we are able to pinpoint this as the moment the gears of legalization started turning in his head. It was in this era that he formed his fascination with public interest law, an area of law that he was only vaguely familiar with at the time. There was a recognition and connection by Keith of the war on drugs and the many people caught up in the legal system due to minor cannabis offenses. Like any great leader, Keith wanted better for the public and he embarked on the journey to do so. When I am asked about uh, why and how I started normal back in 1970, I always feel obliged to let people know that I graduated Georgetown Law School in 1968, and that was right at the height of the Vietnam War, and more importantly to me, um, the anti-Vietnam War protests here in Washington, D.C. During that time, if you uh, were not a full-time student, you were drafted within 30 days, and so all of us stayed in school as long as we could, um, and I did too. But I nonetheless, when I graduated, I was still young enough that I was subject to the draft. And sure enough, within a couple of weeks, I got my notice to take my physical and took it and passed it and was just, a, I don't know, two or three weeks away from my date that I was legally required to report for service when 
with the help of some uh, National Lawyers Guild lawyers. That's a terrific uh, group of lefty lawyers that step in and have played a major role in helping those of us who were, who were referred to at the time as draft dodgers, I think. And uh, they gave me uh, three choices. They offered to put me in touch with some psychiatrists in Baltimore uh, who would say that I was gay. And back then, if you were gay, uh, they didn't want you at all. It wasn't don't ask, don't tell. They just didn't want you in the military. I thought that wasn't a bad option compared to being drafted. But I was married at the time and had a young child, and my wife wasn't terribly thrilled about the idea that her husband might, might be claiming he was gay. Um, the second choice they gave me was they could put me in touch with people in Canada. And Canada has traditionally been a place where sometimes when people – find the policies in the U.S. or something they can't live with. They they leave the country and go to Canada. That was appealing to me, but I, there was no guarantee that one would ever be allowed back in the country. Now, as it turns out, uh, President Carter, within just a very few years, did in fact allow all of the people who had gone to Canada to avoid the war. He allowed them back in the country, but I didn't know that was going to happen, and I wasn't prepared to spend the rest of my life as a Canadian. And then the third option, and the one that ended up saving me, and gets to the point here, is um, they helped get what was called a critical skills deferment. Under the old draft act, if you could demonstrate to the satisfaction of your draft board, and you, you always had a local draft board where you grew up, you didn't, it didn't change even though I'd moved away from Southern Illinois, where I'd grown, uh, I'd grown up on a, on a farm in southern Illinois, but my draft board was still back there. And they were tired of seeing most of the kids back in southern Illinois there did not go on to college, so they were almost all being drafted and sent to Vietnam. And by the time I came along, there was a good bit of resentment that kids from richer parts of the state and urban areas were somehow being uh, finding ways to avoid the draft, but the country kids were not. And so they basically suggested that if I would give them a good excuse, they would give me what's called this critical skills deferment that says if the work you're doing back home is important, and I think the language was to the health, safety, and welfare of the nation, then you could serve your two years working back here instead of going to Vietnam. I had been offered a job uh, right out of law school from a for a presidential commission called the National Commission on Product Safety. It was a commission that uh, had been created because of the work of, of consumer advocate Ralph Nader. Ralph had published a book called Unsafe at Any Speed regarding the dangers of the Corvair automobile, and then subsequently branched out and began to do general product safety work. And he used to have uh, groups of recent law graduates that would come down mostly from Harvard and uh, work with him for a couple of years at a time, uh, finding, identifying unsafe products, and then he would put pressure on members of Congress to pass legislation to protect the consumer. Now, the reason that was important from my standpoint is I've never heard of public interest law. I didn't know what it was. I had always assumed that you go to law school and you end up going back home and practicing law, and maybe you make a little money, but probably have a fairly boring life. But once I was introduced to this concept that you could use your legal degree and your legal skills you learned in law school uh, to try to impact public policy instead of uh, just helping individual clients, uh, that had a real appeal to me. It just seemed to me to be an exciting possibility. And so by that point, I'd been smoking for a number of years, and it was an important issue to me. So I decided uh, uh, when the commission ended after two years, I was then too old to be drafted. So for the first time, I actually had a choice as to what I would do. And I thought, well, I think I'd like to start a public interest project, uh, kind of on the model of what Ralph had done for product safety. But I was concerned about legalizing marijuana. So I called a, a few friends and colleagues, and we began to meet on a regular basis in, in late 1970. And we we founded Normal. So uh, again, it's a, a, I realize a bit of a long roundabout story, but the point is that but for that anti-war activism and the, the fear of being drafted, uh, I don't think I ever would have even thought about starting a group to legalize marijuana. But once I was 
uh, turned off by the war in Vietnam, I realized there were a lot of other things I didn't like about what the government was doing. And so uh, I jumped in with both feet. It seemed to me that uh, marijuana smokers needed a consumer lobby. I had been in, you know, I spent the two years prior to that working with Ralph Nader, and I had felt enjoyed and felt comfortable uh, representing the interest of consumers against manufacturers or sellers or whatever. And so it just seemed to me that when I looked looked out in the field, there was no one making any serious arguments that we ought to end marijuana prohibition and legalize marijuana. So uh, I did it sort of, a, you know, as a lawyer, you couldn't help but be aware of the large numbers of people being arrested and the large numbers of people sitting in jail cells around this country, many of them for very minor offenses. The first year of normal, we went to Texas, and I think at the time they had over 350 people locked up for 10 years or more for simple possession of marijuana. Uh, a, a number of them were just college kids from the University of Texas who had, you know, got caught uh, selling an ounce to another college kid and had been sent away for 10 years or longer. So uh, my motivation when I started it, in addition to the fact that I enjoyed smoking, uh, I didn't like being considered a criminal. I didn't like the risk that I felt every time I uh, went to a, a underground source to score marijuana or any time I sat around with friends on the weekend and shared the joint. We were always painfully aware that if the wrong person happened to walk by and smell the marijuana and call the police, uh, we could be in a heap of trouble. So uh, it just seemed to me that rather than sit around and complain about that, uh, it was an opportunity to maybe do something uh, helpful for marijuana smokers. And so off we off we went. I, I'm I'm quite certain that uh, we were nervous about being targeted because, uh, in fact, I think in most of the interviews I gave during those early times, uh, I acknowledged that I was a personal marijuana smoker. Now I certainly didn't say. For example, when I go home at night, I roll a joint and watch the news. I, I say that now. The world is a different place. And when I'm doing interviews and people ask me if I smoke marijuana, I have to laugh. I said, look, I've been smoking for something like 53 years. But um, when I go home at night, I'm by druggle. I actually roll a joint and pour a glass of wine and watch the news. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a news addict because, uh, like most people in Washington, D.C., we're all government groupies. So we sort of watch the news a lot. But, uh, yeah, my, my idea was uh, I don't want myself uh, to be at risk. I'd like to fix this so that I don't spend the rest of my life having to run and hide from the police. Uh, but I also had enough sense to realize that with, with alcohol prohibition, it only lasted about 11 or 12 years. And the country very quickly uh, realized that prohibition was causing more harm than the use of alcohol itself. We didn't legalize alcohol because it was good for people. We legalized it because prohibition was causing more harm than the drug itself. And it seemed to me that same uh, lesson was clearly in front of us regarding marijuana. But I suppose because marijuana was primarily used by minorities and, and uh, people that were out of the mainstream for many years, uh, the mainstream America and the people that were plugged into policymakers uh, didn't even notice marijuana. It was just considered some sort of a, a silly activity on the edges of, of society. Um, but, you know, for those of us who were doing it, it <laughs> that didn't, that's not what it felt like to us. And uh, here we are 47 years later, and we're still at it. Starting a new business or lobbying group is usually not an easy task. To reach the hearts and minds of people across this nation, you need a budget to do that with. Now imagine trying to start an advocacy group for an illegal plant that has been demonized by the controlling parties for decades. Not so easy. Today, cannabis is still a taboo subject at many dinner tables in this country. Imagine broaching the subject when public acceptance was below 15% compared to the nearly 80% we currently enjoy. When you are dealing with taboo subjects, sometimes you need to reach out to taboo sources for startup and backing money. I suspect you will be surprised when learning where Normal received its initial funding. Equally surprising is the advice Keith had received about accepting this funding from former Attorney General Ramsey Clark. There was actually an interesting story there. Uh, uh, there are two, two people that came into play. For one, uh, I used to 
spend the weekends with some of the early Nader's Raiders, the young lawyers who would come down for a couple of years at a time and work for Ralph. Ralph was always as straight as hell and still is. I don't think Ralph ever saw a marijuana cigarette, let alone smoked one. But most of the Nader's Raiders during those years were uh, were just like the rest. And so we spent a lot of evenings sitting, listening to, to our favorite uh, uh, albums and, uh, and smoking dope. And uh, at one time, uh, one of the Nader's Raiders, his name was John Esposito, asked me, uh, I had started normal, but I didn't yet have any funding. And he'd asked me if I had applied to the Playboy Foundation for funding. And I'm, honestly, I, I didn't even know Playboy had a foundation at that time. Uh, but because he mentioned it, I went ahead and fired off a, a proposal to the foundation. Now, about that same time, I was also uh, meeting with former Attorney General Ramsey Clark. Ramsey had been the Attorney General, general under uh, uh, who, who, whose president was it, uh, Lyndon Johnson, I guess. And, uh, and his father had been a, a Supreme Court justice, by the way, Tom Clark. But anyway, Ramsey Clark, uh, when he stepped aside as attorney general, he became terribly active in the anti-war movement. Uh, and you may remember, if you well, you may not be old enough, but he and Jane Fonda at one time took a trip to Hanoi, and, and there, were, there were millions of Americans who never forgave them, considered them traitors, when all they were doing was trying to, to start a process of uh, – of making friends with the Vietnamese rather than treating them as enemies. At any event, Ramsey had published a book called Crime in America that came out, I believe, in 69, may have been in early 70. And I read the book, and in it, he called for marijuana legalization. And I was really impressed that somebody who had been that high up in our own government would openly call for the legalization of marijuana. So I managed to, to after two or three efforts, to get an appointment with Ramsey. And I explained to him what I was trying to do, but I said, you know, I'm a little nervous because, number one, I don't, um, if I'm throwing away my career, you know, here I just gone, spent four years in college and three years in law school, and all of a sudden I was doing something that I wasn't sure where it was going to lead. I mean, I might end up being arrested and jailed or disbarred or whatever. And so I asked Ramsey whether he thought it was a, a smart thing for me to do. And he actually said, Absolutely. You should do it because it's right. And you should do it while you're young, because these kinds of things, if you if you fall on your face when you're young, you'll have a chance to pick yourself up and, and move on with your life. If you wait until you're older and you have families and, and uh, responsibilities, it's far harder to take those kinds of professional risks. Then I asked him, I said, well, I understand that Playboy folks may have an interest in helping fund normal. But again, I want to be careful here. I don't want to lose what credibility we might have with policymakers because of our being funded by the Playboy Foundation. And he, he told me, he said, you know, he'd written a number of books by then and, of course, had been U.S. Attorney General. But he said when he traveled around the world, mostly when people came up to him and wanted to shake his hand or wanted to get an autograph or something, they knew who he was because of an interview he had done for Playboy magazine. And he said, so he said, I understand the, the concern you have, but he said, I, uh, I thought it was a trade-off that was worth making, and I would recommend you do it. So after that, I went full steam ahead uh, to pursue the Playboy Foundation. They sent someone out to meet me and spend a couple of days to try to get an idea of whether this was a serious effort. Um, then after, I think, maybe three weeks or so, they flew me out to Chicago to uh, to attend a Playboy Foundation board meeting at the mansion, at the Playboy Mansion in Chicago. At that point, he had uh, two mansions, one in L.A. and one in Chicago, but he was still living in Chicago most of the time. And uh, so I flew out there and arrived and met some of the other the board members who were there. But with Hefner, his schedule basically was up to him. And so even though there was a time where we were supposed to have a, a board meeting. If Hef wasn't uh, ready, then the board meeting didn't start. So I, I recall that there were two or three hours of we had to fill some time. I was fascinated just to you know look at the Playboy Mansion and see what a strange life it was compared to my my public interest life here in Washington. <laughs> but um, at some point, uh, Hef showed up and we had a meeting and he asked some uh, what seemed to me to be intelligent questions and. Um, so 
we I left the meeting with uh, no commitment, but with a suggestion that they would be in touch with me within a few days to let me know uh, what they were going to do, if anything. So the first message I got from them was a phone call from Margaret Standish, the woman who was the executive director of the foundation. And Margaret said that they had voted to offer us a $5,000 contribution. And at that point, I really didn't know whether to accept it or not, because I thought, my goodness, $5,000, that's going to last me about two months. You know, what do I do after that? And so uh, I was a, a little nervous about it. And I talked to the, Margaret Standish, the executive director, and she said, Keith, uh, you should take it and show us that you can do something worthwhile. And almost certainly we're going to be coming back to you with some additional funding. And sure enough, to her credit, I did that. And within two or three months, uh, they were uh, committed to giving us a hundred thousand dollars a year in cash and two full time ad, uh, full page ads in Playboy magazine. And back then they had a circulation of, I think, six million subscribers and maybe 20 million readers. So uh, those things were terribly valuable to us. And any time that we would get involved and help some poor young college kid get out of prison in Texas or Missouri or someplace else, uh, Playboy would cover it in, a, I think they called the section the forum in the front of the magazine. I don't know if they still have it or not, honestly. And so uh, it turns out that for the first 10 years of normal, most people who knew about us actually knew about us because they had read about us in Playboy. So it ended up being a, a terrific relationship. And uh, and then on top of that, in 1974, uh, a marijuana smuggler by the name of Tom Frasad had founded High Times magazine. And I first met Tom in 1972 at the Democratic National Committee or uh, National uh, Conference. Uh, when, where George McGovern was nominated for, for the Democratic nominee for president. And uh, I was I was there along with uh, the Margaret Standish from the Playboy Foundation and a couple of other colleagues. And um, what they were doing at the time, they, they had had a problem in the prior convention with activists interrupting and disrupting things in Chicago. So this time they had set aside a whole park about a block or a block and a half from where the convention was where if you were coming to uh, Miami because Miami Beach because you wanted to protest, you could protest all day long in that park because nobody cared. They called it the People's Park. Uh, now, you didn't have much impact on the people attending the, the uh, conference, obviously, because they couldn't see you or hear you. They were a block away. But um, everybody who was anybody who was an activist or an anti-war activist at that time uh, was in the People's Park. And in particular, on one corner, there was something that had a sign up that called it the People's Pot Tree. It was a, a, literally a tree that was growing there. And Tom Frasad would be up in the branches of that tree. And if he wanted to make some marijuana, he'd lower a, a string or a rope with a little clip on it. And you'd give him $20 or whatever you were buying. <laughs> He would he would take the money up and he would lower you and ate the marijuana or half an ounce whatever it was at the time, and uh, so that's I had first met Tom at the People's Pot Tree, <laughs> and uh, I knew you know I talked to him and, and understood that he was in the business as we like to say, but again at that time I didn't know he was about to start a, a magazine which two years later he founded High Times Magazine and so from that point on we also had support both financial and coverage from High Times Magazine as well as Playboy Magazine. Over the years, there have been dozens of federally funded institutions creating biased research about cannabis. A wide range of government agencies and policymakers have used these findings as justifications for their rigid positions and enforcement strategies. As the years have progressed, so have the opinions regarding cannabis in the hallways and offices of decision makers across the land. The perceptions of reefer madness have slowly given way to reason, research, and for an ever-increasing number of Americans, first-hand experience. This was all in the grand plan for Keith Strop and Normal. In 1978, eight years after Normal was founded, 11 states had decriminalized cannabis and there was a feeling that all signs pointed towards full legalization. However, the mood of the nation changed, a lesson we should still keep in mind today. 
the founding of the DEA wasn't particularly significant because remember we had had the Bureau of Narcotics uh, before that, and we'd had the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and then, then they changed the name to the DEA. There had had always been a national police force focused on drug use, trying to arrest drug users. Uh, I, you know what I think? I think it was the cumulative effect of prohibition for 70 years or so that uh, people were honestly misinformed. They were frightened, but they were they weren't uh, evil people who were trying to uh, you know just just harm people's lives. They were people who really had had believed the reefer madness mentality, and they thought that we needed marijuana laws to 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 keep fewer people from experimenting with marijuana. Um, and the only way we overcame that is, I think, familiarity. Over the years, as more and more mainstream Americans were able to come out of the closet, acknowledge their marijuana use. Now, again, most marijuana smokers even today really can't do that because if they did, in many cases, they would lose their jobs. And we don't want the, the, our natural constituency to be unemployed. So uh, what, what we say is if you have a job, where you're either self-employed or otherwise it's not going to harm your employment, please stand up and come out of the closet. We need to demonstrate uh, that marijuana smokers are just average Americans who work hard, pay taxes, contribute in a positive way to their communities. Uh, we're no different than the non-smokers, except when we go home in the evening, uh, they, they open a beer or pour themselves a glass of wine and we roll a joint. Um, but the only way to overcome those negative stereotypes of all those years, including the ones that were fanned by Reagan and his folks, were they had to see real live Americans who were mainstream, were successful, uh, you know, had college degrees, uh, dressed in coats and ties, uh, but who were marijuana smokers. And so I attribute uh, the, the, and it wasn't like one big leap at any one time. When you look at the like Gallup polls over those years, you'll see it was a long steady uh, improvement starting again in about 1990, and it's never gone back. In other words, we haven't lost ground since then. We pick up one or two or three percentage points of support every year, and I don't, I don't honestly see that changing. Uh, I think most of our opponents are contemporaries of mine. I'm 74 years old, and most of our opponents were my age or older, and they've either died or retired and stepped aside and been replaced by younger people. And younger Americans don't have any trouble with marijuana. Whether, whether they smoke it or not almost doesn't matter. They're familiar with it. They grew up with it. They're not frightened by it. So it seems to me that uh, I, I, there's, I always have a little bit of a concern in the back of my mind that just like the pendulum swung back against us in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, I wonder, could it happen again? I don't think so, because we have so much public support today that we didn't have back in the late 70s, early 80s. During the early years, the, the first decade or so, uh, our progress was primarily um, uh, focused on decriminalizing marijuana. That is, stop arresting ordinary marijuana smokers. We weren't brave enough or, or didn't have enough credibility yet uh, have any impact of convincing state legislatures to legalize marijuana, but the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse had been established as a subsection of the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. A uh, little history here. The, the prior federal marijuana act had been declared unconstitutional in a case where a uh, former Harvard professor, Tim Leary, had been caught coming from Mexico with, I don't know, 10 pounds of marijuana or something, and uh, he had the reputation and the money to hire the best lawyers, but uh, he was also sitting in a jail cell for a while. And they brought a constitutional challenge, and it was successful. So there were, there were about nine months in 1970 where there was no federal anti-marijuana law. Now, it didn't matter because all 50 states had anti-marijuana laws. But nonetheless, when the Congress got around to it then, they wanted to pass a new uh, Anti-Drug Act, and what they passed was called the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. It's still the Federal Drug Act. And Ed Koch, who was a Democratic congressman from New York at the time, he was liberal when he was in Congress. Later, he was mayor of New York for a couple of terms, and he was pretty conservative during that phase of his life. But when he was in Congress, 
uh, I got to know him. It was the first couple of years of normal. And he managed to get a provision put in the Controlled Substances Act that created the National Commission on Product Safety. I'm sorry, National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse. And it was a two-year uh, study group. Uh, I think the president appointed nine members and, and Congress selected four from among themselves. And so that commission was tasked with the job of coming up with uh, a marijuana policy the first year and other drug policy the second year. Well, because they were mainly picked by former President Nixon and, uh, and some sitting members of Congress, initially we didn't expect much from the commission. Uh, they weren't very well uh, informed about marijuana. Uh, I think only maybe one of them had ever smoked marijuana. Um, and uh, so we were assuming they were going to come back and sort of rubber stamp what Nixon wanted. But in fact, they ended up taking their work seriously and in fact, so seriously that at one point out on the West Coast, when they were holding hearings, they had some private sessions where they invited marijuana smokers to come and meet with the commissioners. And again, off the record, all private, uh, these marijuana smokers would smoke some weed and, and uh, give the commissioners a chance to spend an hour or two with them and see that when you get high, it doesn't turn you into some crazy maniac. In fact, they were pretty impressed that it, you know, it seemed to be uh, less disruptive than alcohol would have been. So when the commission came around after that first year with their recommendation, they shocked the hell out of Nixon and, and most of the country by recommending that we should decriminalize marijuana. Now, they didn't have the political courage to go all the way to legalization, but they did recommend that we should be allowed to possess uh, an ounce or two of marijuana, it'd be perfectly legal. And that recognizing that marijuana smokers share marijuana with each other, they also included a recommendation that we be allowed to, to uh, give marijuana to, for, to adult friends uh, up to an ounce uh, as well, not to sell it, but to share it with friends. So it was a fairly startling at the time. Uh, it was in 1972 when they came, 1973, I think, when they came out. I forget which of those years with the marijuana report. No, no, it was 72. And uh, it, it seemed fairly radical to a lot of people. But um, the, the main thing about it was the commission was going out of business. In other words, they make their recommendation, but there were no provisions in the, in the, uh, in the law that established the marijuana commission for a group to continue to try to then implement those recommendations. So Normal took the job of traveling around the country with, with expert witnesses. We had some members of the commission itself or former members who were willing to go with us and testify. We had some prosecutors that were doing it. We had uh, one guy, John Finlater, who had been number two in the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration federally, DEA who uh, had come to his senses and made himself available. So for uh, about the next seven, eight years, any time we could identify a young state legislator or any state legislator, but most of them who were synthetic were younger, who was willing to introduce a marijuana decriminalization bill, we would fly out this team of experts so that uh, they, when they held their legislative hearing, uh, there was some some serious weight behind that proposal. It wasn't they couldn't get by acting as if it was just some radical recommendation. And as it turns out, uh, Oregon was the first in 1973. They became the first state to adopt a modified version of decriminalization. They they ended up keeping a hundred dollar civil fine. They they didn't quite have the votes to totally decriminalize it, but nonetheless. A hundred dollar civil fine instead of a you know a year or two in jail was one hell of an improvement, and so we kept at it. And by 1978, we had decriminalized marijuana in 11 states. The last of those was Nebraska in 78, and we were on a roll. We thought within three, four, five years we'd have the whole country decriminalized. But what we didn't anticipate is that sometimes the public mood switches. Um, you know, I, I think all of us tend to think about progress on political issues of occurring in a linear fashion, but they don't always. Sometimes that pendulum swings back the other way. And by the late 70s and the early 80s, we had Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan and the parents groups and just say no. And their argument at the time largely was 
that we shouldn't be allowed to have marijuana or to smoke marijuana because it wasn't good for kids. In other words, if somehow adults shouldn't be allowed to do anything that was inappropriate for kids. Well, if, if you really adopted that standard, you couldn't uh, skydive or drive a car or have sex or all, any kind, all kinds of things that adults are, are allowed to do in our society but are inappropriate for kids. But nonetheless, we went 18 years from 1978 until 1996 without a single statewide victory for marijuana reform. That was a long drought. But by 19, I think about 1990, the pendulum or the polling started showing that we were begin to pick up a little more support each year. Uh, and by 1996, when I say the 18 years without a victory in 1996, that's when California became the first state to legalize medical marijuana. What had happened is during that 18 year drought, uh, the issue had undergone some changes internally. I don't think it was a, it wasn't a, like a grand strategy. It's just the way it happened. And uh, it turns out that uh, we were now debating should seriously ill patients be allowed to use marijuana as a medicine. And of course, after California in 96, then we began to pick up more and more states until today we have 31 states that allow medical use of marijuana. And uh, again, I'm, I'm confident that within a few years, we'll have all 50. Uh, the polling on that right now shows that somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the entire adult population favor the medical use of marijuana. So in, in uh, answer to your question about what normal has achieved, the early phase was the decriminalization in 11 states. The second phase uh, was popularizing the medical use of marijuana. And by the way, on the second phase, it wasn't just us. You also had the Drug Policy Foundation. Uh, you had marijuana uh, uh, MPP, Marijuana Policy Project. So there were, there were more players in this second phase. Um, and then starting in, um, well, 2012 was when we first picked up the first two states, Colorado and Washington, with full recreational legalization. Um, and on and on. In other words, I, I have never been more optimistic because when we started this battle in 1970, Gallup polling folks had just for the first time asked the American people, uh, how many of you favor legalizing marijuana? Prior to that, they didn't even think it was an important enough issue to include in a poll. But they asked their first one in 69, and we found the normal 70. Only 12% of the American public were on our side. 88% were opposed to what we were trying to achieve. That's obviously not a, a, a successful business model when one can base a campaign on. But over these many years, as we continue to, to work the issue, the polling starting, as I mentioned, in about uh, 1990, began to pick up again in our direction. And by 2011, we had 50% of the country favoring full legalization. And in the last three or four years, we're now up just in the last year, we have, I think it's five different national polling groups, including Gallup, that show 65% or higher favor full legalization, two out of three Americans. Now, that's incredibly, uh, you know, it, it's hard to imagine that we would have that kind of support when you realize that only about 14% of the country are current marijuana smokers. Uh, roughly 40% of the adult population have smoked marijuana at some time in their lives, but only about 14% are current users, and that's pretty uh, consistent throughout blacks, Hispanics, and whites. So the reason we're winning this with 65% and higher is because we have largely won the hearts and minds of the non-smoking public, of the majority of the non-smokers. Without their support, we simply couldn't win this. You, know, you can't win an issue with 14 or 15% support. And what's interesting and why that's uh, crucial to how we uh, behave as we move forward is that their support is not pro-pot largely. It's anti prohibition. Uh, they have finally concluded, the majority of the non-smokers, uh, I'm sure that it also had to do with getting more familiar with marijuana and realizing it wasn't as dangerous as they had been led to believe for many years. But again, uh, they weren't saying uh, we think pot's good or we think people should smoke. They were saying we think prohibition causes far more problems for society 
than the use of marijuana itself. So uh, we we now are at this phase where uh, we the reason I am so optimistic about the the immediate future is because uh, we now have two thirds of the American public who are on our side. Keeping true to form as a longtime consumer advocate, a large desire of Keith's for the legal market would be to see better safety and quality standards of products available to the public. As is, each state has unique laws regarding testing requirements, labeling requirements, approved and banned pesticides, as well as handling and packaging protocols. A unified framework and testing methodology is one of the many goals Keith and Normal strive for. Over the decades, there have been many government agencies tasked with the responsibility of watching over cannabis, but only as an illegal substance and where the primary focus was determined and eradication. Normal and the cannabis legislation movement have gained an incredible amount of ground over the years, but the fight is far from over for Keith and others. There is an opinion amongst many policy advocates that cannabis monopolies are just as dangerous for personal cannabis freedoms as bad laws have been. We're not looking for the federal government to dictate marijuana policy to the states. We're looking for them to do the same thing we did at the end of alcohol prohibition, which is simply back the federal government out of the way so the states are free to do whatever they want. We would hope most of them will experiment with different models of legalization and regulation and taxation. Uh, But if there are a few states that want to continue prohibition for a few more years, that's their right. That's what happened with alcohol prohibition. Uh, There were a number of states that maintained prohibition uh, even after it it had been repealed federally. And there are even some counties now in Kentucky and Tennessee, for example, that are dry counties. You still can't buy a drink in those counties. But obviously, most of them have come around. And I think the same thing will happen uh, with marijuana. But again, I'm not worried about that being misused because I don't think there's any serious support for a prescription model, for example. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of pharmaceutical companies who would like to make that into federal policy. I don't see that happening. Uh, They they may uh, well, well, there are already a couple of prescription drugs uh, that some people could use for their medical use. Uh, But I I don't think you're going to see any attempt to do that for recreational use. What you will see is some of those prescription companies or, or pharmaceutical companies and other big companies will undoubtedly begin to invest in the marijuana industry. Look, when you see what's happening in Canada right now, there are quite a few big corporations that are raising tens of millions of dollars and, and you know, buying up a, a lot of uh, uh, the market in Canada. Uh, but again, you know, we're, we're in a phase where we're going to make some mistakes in some provinces and in some states. But overall, we learn from each one of those. So the next next state or next province, we can do better. Most of us who are involved in uh, policymaking in this area would prefer to avoid the industry being taken over by a few uh, major players. You know, we don't want to replicate big tobacco, for example. But what I do think is I think we should aim and we are trying our best to try to mimic the wine industry in the U.S. There are some major big players in the wine industry, but there are tens of thousands of small players who just own a small vineyard and produce, you know, a small number of bottles every year, but they they produce great product and um, they avoid being taken over and controlled by two or three big monopolies. So again, it's a free enterprise system we live in. So I understand that if some big player wants to come in with unlimited deep pockets and sort of start buying people out, then it's up to the people who own those companies if they're going to sell. But at least to the extent we can encourage people, uh, we would encourage them. uh, We'd like an unlimited number of licenses in these states. I don't like it when a state like Ohio, I think, only had 15 licenses or something. You're just setting up a monopoly. And usually the licenses end up going to the friends of the state legislature. So uh, I would much prefer that we end up with something akin to the wine country in Northern California or in Oregon or Washington, as far as that goes. Both those states have a a thriving wine industry as well. Because of a section called 280E of the Internal Revenue Service Code, uh, people who are in the marijuana industry cannot write off usual and ordinary business expenses. The one exception and it's kind of ironic, but they are allowed to write off the cost of the product. 
That is, you know, if they're if they're a retailer and they're buying from a, a cultivation center, they can write off the cost they pay for the marijuana, but they can't write off their rent, their salaries, their any other expense. They simply cannot write off. So in fact, they end up paying an uh, effective tax rate that's often in 75, 80% rate, and that's not sustainable. There, there's no industry that can last for too long uh, paying that kind of high taxes. But again, there are bills, proposals in Congress that we don't have enough support to get them passed yet, but there are proposals in Congress to fix that, to allow those in the industry to accept credit cards, to have bank accounts, to write off their usual ordinary and business expenses. In other words, we should be treated just like other legal industries. But again, the problem is because of the conflict between state and federal law, it's it's not the states that are hurting us on that level. It's the feds because of the IRS. In I think in every state that has legalized marijuana, there's going to be a shakeout period the first few years where there, if they don't have a limit on the number of dispensaries and the number of cultivation licenses, you're going to end up with more production uh, than the consumer demand uh, needs. And when you do that, you're right. It's like Oregon now. They, I think I saw something the other day where uh, the, the legal demand for uh, marijuana in Oregon is only about a third of the of what is actually being produced. And as a result, of course, there, there's Oregon marijuana apparently being distributed throughout the rest of the country. And although, you know, I'm a marijuana smoker, I'm certainly glad there's good marijuana out there on the black market. The fact is, uh, it's to our advantage to switch from the black market to the above ground market and have it regulated. And so uh, I think in terms of the financial risk, if you're in a free, uh, a free market economy, I don't think there's any way you can really avoid that. You're either going to limit the number and therefore create a kind of a monopoly, or you're going to not limit the number, and that means that there are going to be some people that drop out. They're, going to, they're not going to be able to have a sustainable business model. Now, maybe there's a, there's a, a happy medium where you could figure out how many licenses would you need so that uh, nobody can operate like a monopoly and set the prices where they want? We want the free market to establish the price. On the other hand, uh, we, we really would hope that the people who work hard and spend money for licenses and develop the expertise, we'd like to see them succeed. Uh, because again, if they don't, they're going to end up selling out to some of these bigger companies that we'd rather not control the market. So uh, again, that's why it's partly why it's so exciting right now is that we're really at that point where uh, every new state that comes along and legalizes marijuana does it a little differently than the states before it. And that's, that's a good thing. We need to continue to try to be creative and come up with new ways to avoid just what you were talking about. Uh, I, it is not in our interest to have a thriving underground market. Uh, because it, it it makes it more difficult on the, the legal growers and sellers. And they can't really compete with an underground market generally. What we want is we want marijuana that's, uh, that's high quality, affordable, convenient, and safe. And when I say safe, it needs to be uh, examined by a laboratory to be sure there's no uh, moles or pest, dangerous pesticides in it. We need to have labeling that's accurate, to at least of the THC and the CBD, and I think even the major terpenoids. Um, so there, there are a lot of things to still be done. I mean, we're, sometimes people ask me, uh, is normal going to put yourself out of work? And I say, man, I don't see that happening because, for example, even in legalization states today, a private employer is still allowed to fire somebody who tests positive for THC without any evidence they ever came to work in an impaired condition. They are allowed to maintain what they like to call a drug-free workplace, but of course it's not drug-free because half of their employees go out and drink beer for lunch. But it, it, what it really means is you're not allowed to, to have THC in your system. Similarly, if you're a couple who have young children and some nosy neighbor smells marijuana and complains to the state child welfare agency, and this happens all too frequently, they will call the parents uh, insist on a home inspection to make sure the home is clean and safe to raise young kids in. In other words, this presumption that if you smoke marijuana, you may live in a filthy home. Um, and they almost always make them uh, take a drug education course and a parenting course uh, 
And then usually they are allowed to keep their kids, but it's an enormous uh, unfair process that they're put through that sometimes goes on for months. And also with DUID, uh, driving under the influence of drugs, there are a dozen or so states that have what are called zero tolerance DUID laws, per se laws, where if you're pulled over for a traffic offense and they test you for alcohol and they don't, uh, they don't show any alcohol, they will then test you for THC. And if they find any THC, uh, you are automatically guilty of a DUID. You lose your license for six months to a year. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly unfair procedure because, indeed, uh, you're only high for about 90 minutes after you smoke marijuana. But you will test positive for several days after you last smoked marijuana. If you're a long-term smoker, you'll test positive for several weeks. So right now, we still have a lot of work to do to get to the place, even in the states that have legalized, where responsible marijuana smokers are treated fairly in all aspects of their lives. And that's our goal at Normal. Keith Stroff is one of the great intellectuals within the cannabis legalization movement. and He has been able to use this gift to work on changing the system from within the legal framework. He has enjoyed a successful career serving Normal as the founder and executive director, but also in the role which he currently holds as legal counsel. Along the journey, he has served as a lobbyist for American farmers, was a founding partner in a legal defense firm representing people charged with drug-related crimes, and later he worked for a firm defending nonviolent related drug offenses. Keith didn't partake in cannabis until he was past his teen years, but that experience made an impact on him, and he has been a lifelong cannabis enthusiast and advocate every day of his life since. The impact that Keith and Normal have made on everyday life of cannabis enthusiasts in the United States is undeniable. It comes as no surprise, Keith was awarded the 2012 High Times Lifetime Achievement Award. His contributions have been many, and even today the fight continues. Keith meets that challenge head on, just one of the many reasons Keith's drop belongs in the corridors of dope history.